Uh, okay, so go ahead. Okay, great. So thanks very much for having me. It's, uh, I've been meaning to uh, come give a talk for a while, and now that everything's virtual, it's a little bit easier to do that. So I'm glad that it finally worked out. Um, I, as I was preparing this talk, I, um, you know, I realized I didn't quite know either what are the what's the background of the audience, uh, or what the interests of the audience are. So um, I hope that as I go through the talk, you can feel free to stop me and ask me questions. I mean, uh, right now. The disadvantage of talking virtually is that I, I'm basically talking to a wall uh, and I have no idea whether anyone's even listening. Um, but, you know, feel free to stop me at any time with questions. I don't need to finish all the slides. If there's something of interest, I can, um, I can, uh, you know, spend more time on it. If uh, there's something not of interest, I can, I can kind of go through it quickly and that's fine. Um, what I wanted to kind of convey, you know, in addition to the technical results that I'm going to talk about, is just a little bit about uh, a little bit of a view of um, where I see cryptography right now. I think it's actually a very interesting time. The last couple of years, actually, maybe even decade or so, has been a very interesting time in cryptography, and especially from the point of view of, say, theory versus practice in cryptography. Because what I've seen uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so is, well, this is actually a more general statement that cryptography provides really one of the best examples of theory having an impact on practice. That's a statement that's true even for the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years of cryptography. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, thinking through definitions, formal definitions and models of security, uh, in terms of the fact, you know, starting in the mid 80s or so, when people realized that you could actually give rigorous proofs of security for cryptographic constructions uh, based on certain mathematical assumptions. Um, and that's, and these proofs of security is something that's actually become more and more uh, important, not just among the theorists who were interested in that in the 80s, but then among the wider community, and now it's a regular part of any standardization process to really focus on, you know, the definitions and whether they're appropriate or not, whether they're capturing the full adversarial model that you might be interested in, and then also whether the schemes that are being standardized come with any sort of proofs of security, and if so, under what assumptions and under what conditions and et cetera. So that's something that's really permeated um, applied cryptography nowadays. Things like the random oracle model, which I, I just won't uh, dwell on, um, other things you can look at also that have come from the theory community, but then become important in practice as well. And more recently, I think we've seen a lot of ideas from uh, what I would call theoretical crypto uh, being pushed into practice. And let me just discuss a couple of examples. And these are things that we, when they came out, when they were published, I think the authors themselves didn't even think that these would necessarily have any practical applications. These were papers being written by theorists caring only about theory for its own sake, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm putting myself maybe in the author's position a little bit. But it, what's been amazing is that these ideas that at first seemed completely theoretical uh, and not beautiful nonetheless and interesting, but, but didn't seem to have any connection to practice, you know, 10, 15 years later, it turns out can actually have real world impact. And just a couple of examples that uh, I, I think of here are things like a verifiable random function. So a verifiable random function was an idea that was put forth, I think, 20 years ago, actually. And at the time, just seemed like a completely theoretical concept. Uh, and now it's being used inside cryptocurrency protocols to, uh, for those who are familiar with this, it's for, used for leader election in these protocols to try to ensure uh, security in a distributed system. Um, generic secure computation, this is what I'm going to be talking about today. This is something that I think when it was proposed in the 80s and even up until uh, maybe the late 1990s, people really did not think that it would have a hope of being practical. I'm talking here about secure computation of uh, generic Boolean circuits. But uh, now we have uh, multiple libraries implementing secure computation for Boolean and arithmetic circuits and uh, also people looking to use these in the real world. Um, homomorphic encryption is another example. Um, searchable encryption, differential privacy, which is being adopted by the Census Bureau, actually, uh, for when they're doing this, the current census. Uh, these things that, again, when people proposed them, were not they were not necessarily thinking ahead toward practical application, but nevertheless, these beautiful ideas turned out to have, um, to have practical applications. And I think that's really an amazing success story for the field of cryptography as a whole. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to look at one particular example of this, perhaps. I'm going to take what I think, again, uh, had been considered purely theoretical ideas and try to basically push them to their limits and come up with something practical and obtain a result that's of potential uh, practical relevance. Um, and specifically, what I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at these um, ideas that came out of the secure computation literature. 
uh, as well as the zero knowledge literature on uh, taking what's called uh, the MPC in the head approach, which is something I'm going to explain uh, as part of this talk. Uh, but it's an approach basically for turning secure computation protocols into zero knowledge protocols. Uh, using, the, using that idea along with a particular uh, efficient protocol that we developed to construct generic non-interactive zero knowledge proofs. Uh, generic again means that it can be applied for an arbitrary Boolean circuit. Using that to, um, uh, like I said, push it to its limits and see how efficient we can make it and construct from that efficient post-quantum signatures. So you may be aware that NIST is currently in the middle of a, of a, a it, it's actually technically not called a competition, but it's some kind of process by which they're trying to uh, select standards for next generation cryptography that will be resilient to quantum computers. And uh, the work that I'm going to be describing today actually led to a submission uh, to that process, which uh, has since made it to the third round and, and uh, is, still, is still under consideration. So uh, this actually leads something to something that could potentially, although it doesn't seem likely at this point, potentially could become a standard for a, uh, a usable post-quantum signature scheme. So just to give an outline of where I'm going to go in this talk, um, I did not want to assume that people had prior knowledge on uh, either secure computation or zero knowledge proofs. So I'll briefly define those concepts uh, to, just, to, just to kind of give you the basics of what we're talking about here. Um, I'll discuss this MPC in the head approach that I talked about, and then I'll talk about how we extended it and instantiated it, uh, and then talk about the signature scheme that we developed based on these ideas as well. And like I said, you can feel free to stop anytime. I can't see anybody, and I think you all have your videos off anyway. But if there are any questions, you can feel free to um, to stop me at any time and let me know. Okay, so just a background on zero knowledge. Um, so zero knowledge proofs are, are a concept that was introduced in the uh, 80s. It's a beautiful idea, really. It's the idea of proving some statement is true without revealing any other information uh, about why that statement is true. And the way we can think about it for the purposes of this talk is that we have a prover on the left in this picture and a verifier on the right. Uh, both the prover and the verifier hold a circuit. Uh, you can think of it as a Boolean circuit, if you like, for concreteness. And that's denoted by the capital C in this diagram. And the prover additionally knows an input to the circuit that I'm here calling W uh, on which the circuit evaluates to one. Right, so the prover knows that there's an input on which the circuit evaluates to one and wants to convince the verifier that there does exist, it indeed exists such an input. Um, and it allows the prover and verifier to interact in a sequence of rounds, after which the verifier makes a decision whether or not to accept or reject, right? If it accepts the proof, then it believes the prover that there is indeed an input that makes the circuit evaluate to one. And if not, uh, the verifier will reject the proof. Um, and the, there are two basic security properties here that we need. Uh, one is that we want some kind of notion of soundness, which is to say that if the, um, uh, if the malicious, if it, even if, if, sorry, even if a verifier is interacting with a malicious prover, uh, the prover should not be able to make the verifier accept if there is no accepting input to the circuit. Okay, so in other words, just flipping it around and taking the converse, if we have uh, even a malicious prover that can make the verifier accept, then indeed we're convinced, the verifier is convinced that the prover indeed knows a W, knows an input such that the circuit evaluates to one on that input. And then we also want the zero knowledge property, um, uh, possibly in a weaker form that I'm here calling honest verifier zero knowledge, which basically says that the verifier learns nothing from this interaction other than the fact that the circuit is satisfiable, other than the fact that there is an input that makes a circuit evaluate to one. So in particular, the verifier doesn't learn W. It doesn't even learn a single bit of information about W. It doesn't learn any of the bits of W. It doesn't learn anything about W um, that, it, uh, that it didn't know before. Okay, so this is a very paradoxical kind of idea that you can do this. Uh, it would translate to something like, <clears throat> you know, having a mathematical theorem and being able to convince you that the theorem is true without actually, you know, without actually revealing to you anything about why this theorem is true. Um, so it's amazing that these things can exist, but nevertheless, it turns out that these zero knowledge proofs do exist for, for many interesting um, uh, languages. And in particular for this problem that I presented here of showing that there is an input that makes a circuit evaluate to one, uh, that gives you actually uh, zero knowledge proofs for all of the class NP. 
so that's zero knowledge. Now, secure computation is a little bit different. Uh, it considers a set of parties uh, who might be distributed across the network, and they all wish to um, jointly compute some function over their respective inputs. So here in this picture, I have seven parties. They hold inputs X1 through X7, so each party knows only its own input. They want to compute, as I said, some function over these inputs. So since we're talking about elections, maybe uh, each party holds input uh, a bit, zero or one, and they want to compute the majority vote. Uh, and they want to do this in, a, in such a way that it's not only, only going to give the correct outcome, but it's also not going to reveal any information uh, beyond the outcome itself. Was there a question? I heard someone un unmute, or I, I don't know if there was a question or not. Uh, so the parties are going to do this by running some uh, interactive distributed protocol, after which they'll each learn the result uh, that I'm calling Y here, the result of the function that they agreed to compute on each of their respective inputs. And the protocol is going to be secure if it provides an emulation of an execution with a trusted party. So what does that uh, mean? So I didn't put the picture here, but what that means is basically you can imagine a mental model, an ideal world in which each of the parties simply sends their input to this trusted party. The trusted party computes the function on their behalf, and then that party returns the output to each of the parties. Okay, so if indeed that trusted party is incorruptible, then this will give us uh, basically what we want. And in particular, that ideal model with the trusted party would give us um, correctness, uh, privacy of the inputs, right? Each party learns only the output, uh, the output value Y. It doesn't learn anything about other parties' inputs. Uh, beyond what's implied by the output. Uh, it gives us other properties as well that I won't go into detail here. Um, and a secure computation protocol will emulate this ideal model, meaning that it will also give us correctness, privacy, et cetera, everything we want, um, under some assumptions about the behavior of the adversary. And in particular, the ones that are, are, are maybe of the most interest are some bound on the number of corruptions. So how many of these N parties running the protocol are, are assumed to be corrupted? Uh, clearly, if all of them are corrupted, it's not really interesting. So you either assume that all but one are corrupted, or maybe you assume that uh, at most half are corrupted or strictly less than half are corrupted uh, or what have you. Uh, and then you can also have different protocols depending on whether you want to assume that the attacker is semi-honest, meaning they're passive, they're running the protocol, but they're trying to learn information from the execution of the protocol. Uh, or you can have protocols with malicious security that are resilient even to an adversary who tries to uh, deviate from the protocol in any way they choose. And they still won't be able to learn anything from the execution beyond, um, uh, they, still, they still will basically not be able to learn anything or break security of the protocol in any way. Okay. And again, uh, if you haven't seen this concept before, uh, these secure computation protocols, as I said, have been studied since the 80s. And we now know essentially, um, I, the way I would say it is that everything you want is possible. You can achieve the strongest notions of security, so you can achieve security against a malicious adversary who compromises even all but one of the parties, uh, and you can uh, and you can do this for any function. So you can take any function that can be uh, any function that can be expressed as a Boolean circuit, which is any function, and uh, you can then come up with a secure computation protocol uh, for that function. So it's quite uh, powerful. And I'll just mention, since I touched on this at the beginning of my talk, that there's really been amazing progress in generic secure computation in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And in the last five years in particular, we've seen not only these libraries implementing secure computation that I talked about, but a lot of interest in uh, deploying secure computation uh, by the government, uh, by various startups, and even by established companies like, um, like Google as well. So it's really something that's gone, as I said, from something that's, that came out of the theoretical computer science community and developed now into something where there's a lot of uh, real world interest in deploying this stuff. Uh, but this is not going to be the focus of my uh, talk today. That's maybe a different talk. Um, I will note that uh, zero knowledge is a special case of secured two-party computation. Why is that? Well, you can view the zero knowledge protocol as being a secure computation of the circuit itself, right? In this case, you kind of uh, have a trivial uh, situation where one party, the, the verifier, has no input. Uh, the prover is the only one who has input in this protocol, and the function they're computing is to evaluate the circuit C on the first party's input uh, and then give the output, say, to the verifier. And if that output is one, then that convinces the verifier that um, there is indeed an input that makes the circuit evaluate to one. Uh, otherwise, the, the, uh, the prover will not be able to uh, provide any input, which will cause this, the, um, the output to be one. So you can view zero knowledge as a special case of 
uh, two-party computation. Uh, nevertheless, it's interesting to study zero knowledge uh, independent of secure computation for a couple of reasons. Um, I just put two here. One of them is that you can you can actually base zero knowledge proofs on weaker assumptions than secure computation. Uh, you can also hope for more uh, efficient uh, direct constructions, and that's like something we're going to see uh, from today's talk. So, any questions so far about what I've uh, talked about? Question on the um, oh, yeah. Okay, can can you go back a hop back a section? Yeah. To see. Does the does the verifier know and trust C, the function? Uh, well, the verifier knows C. Um, mm -hmm. As far as what it means to trust it, I'm not sure what what that means. I mean, the verifier, yeah, I'm not sure what it would mean to trust it. I mean, C is just a circuit. Um, you, you're asking whether it corresponds to something the verifier cares yeah, about. I, I thought that the prover was. So what zero knowledge in my mind was the prover is trying to give evidence to the verifier that the prover is uh, who she claims to be without uh, revealing uh, her method of proof to the verifier so that you so, cut off so, any further attacks by the verifier than going to claim to be the prover to somebody else like the Needham Schroeder yeah, uh, kind of situation. Yeah. So I think actually that's a little bit different. I think what, what, uh, what I would say is that you can use zero knowledge protocols to do identification, to construct identification protocols, but uh, they're not okay. the same. And here, there's no notion of identification. Here, I don't even care. I don't care to know who the prover is or not. Uh, the prover might be proving something that has nothing to do with their public key. They might be proving, uh, I don't know, that they can factor some number that's on the internet, uh, or they might be proving something else entirely. It may have no connection okay, with their identity. So in this in this definition, zero knowledge means that the verifier does not learn the private inputs of the prover. Is that correct? Yeah, it doesn't learn W, right? Okay, okay. So yeah. to me, that's kind of a different version of zero knowledge proofs for authentication. But, right. Okay. So what I'm saying is that zero knowledge uh, authentication protocols are different from zero knowledge protocols. Um, you can use Got zero it. knowledge protocols to build authentication protocols. You can also do authentication without zero knowledge. Um, All right. So they're not. So they're not. They're not identical. I can. I mean, I can. That's see an important distinction, and, and that confuses me whenever I read paper. But anyway, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Well, Appreciate well, as a side, as a side note, I mean, I, I've gone to Wikipedia many times, and they have this notion of you know password-based authentication. I forget what the page is, and they and they they call it password-based zero knowledge, and I keep on taking out the zero knowledge, and someone else keeps putting it back in. <laughs> so you know, don't trust don't, the moral is don't trust Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, yeah. So here, here we're not doing identification yet. I mean, we, we're going to construct zero knowledge, and then we then we're going to use it to build a signature scheme. But you know, you can use it to do other things as well. Uh, good. So now this MPC in the head approach. So this MPC in the head approach is going to be is a nice idea for how to take a zero uh, take a secure computation protocol, and use it to construct a zero knowledge protocol. And the way this works is as follows. So here I just put the circuit on the right, but the but the prover knows it as well. Um, but the prover in particular also has the input W to the circuit that makes it evaluate to one. And what the prover is going to do is the following. Okay, it's a little bit uh, conceptually uh, maybe difficult to wrap your head around, but let's see if we can do it. So the idea is what the prover is going to do, they're going to simulate an execution of a secure computation protocol in their head. So you imagine that the, the prover is just a, a single machine, but they're going to simulate on their machine, you know, seven other programs that are running that are running as if they're running this distributed protocol. Uh, what function are they going to be computing? They're going to be computing C, and they're going to be computing. Um, they're going to be running a secure computation protocol of C, where the inputs to the parties are going to be a secret sharing of W. Okay, so think that. Uh, the prover gives to each of these parties a random value such that the XOR of all those seven values is equal to W. And then the function a little bit more formally that the parties are going to be computing is the function that says, well, XOR all the parties' inputs together and then evaluate C on the result. Okay. Um, so after the prover does this simulation of the protocol, this is why it's called MPC in the head, what they're going to do is they're going to box up the view of every party in this protocol. Okay, what is the view of a party? It means all their local state during the protocol, all the messages they've seen coming in, uh, their input, any local randomness they used, anything else. They're going to box that up and they're going to send a commitment of that value of the view of each party to the verifier. Okay, you can think of a commitment if you're not familiar with that uh, cryptographic concept, think of it as like a sealed 
uh, a sealed box. Okay, so the prover puts the view of each party into a sealed box and sends it to the verifier. What the verifier then does is it's going to challenge the prover on some subset of the parties, and the prover is then going to open up the boxes corresponding to those parties. Okay, that means that the verifier can now see the local state, the views of some number of the parties. And what the verifier is then going to do is it's going to check, first of all, whether the views of those parties that are opened are consistent with a correct execution of the protocol with output one, okay? because if the prover was honest, that execution of the protocol would have resulted in each party of the protocol getting output one, and also that the views of the parties are consistent with each other. So in particular, if, uh, if the verifier asks to open up parties I and J, then if, uh, if the view of party I says they sent a message to party J, then the view of party J should say that they received that message from party I. Okay, and if there's an inconsistency, then basically it's as if the, the verifier has caught the prover cheating. And if all of these uh, in the bottom right are correct, then the verifier will accept the proof and believe that the prover is actually honest and that the circuit is satisfiable. So um, first of all, let's look at the two properties we talked about earlier. So notice that if the protocol, if the secure computation protocol that this prover is running in their head is private against T corrupted parties, meaning that no subset of T colluding parties learns anything about the inputs of the other parties, then this protocol, this interactive protocol between the prover and the verifier is gonna be zero knowledge as long as few, uh, you know, at most T parties views are opened, right? Because the T parties views that the verifier sees uh, are going to be equivalent to what the to what an attacker would learn by corrupting T of the parties in an execution of the protocol. And so privacy of the protocol implies that the verifier learns nothing about W, even though it may learn individual random shares of, of some of the parties, it's going to learn nothing about W from opening the views of some uh, of up to T parties. Uh, moreover, as far as soundness goes, it's interesting to observe that semi-honest security of the protocol is enough in order to guarantee security even against a malicious prover. Okay, so why is that? Because basically, if the execution of the protocol, um, uh, or let me say differently, if the verifier would have been able to catch the prover, uh, if all the, if all the, uh, sorry, so if the verifier checks some number of parties and they're all consistent with the correct execution and consistent with each other, then that implies that, except with some small probability that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, that implies that the, in fact, all the parties' views are all consistent with the correct execution that are all consistent with each other. And then just correctness of the protocol alone, of the secure computation protocol, is enough to imply soundness of the zero knowledge protocol. Now, there is some probability that the prover can cheat, right? How can the prover cheat? Well, maybe what the prover can do is it can actually send some inconsistent views to the verifier, right? It can send these initial boxes uh, containing the different views, and maybe some of them are going to be inconsistent with each other, and the prover can hope that the verifier won't challenge on those inconsistent parties. And in general, I mean, without knowing something specific about the protocol, in general, it may be enough for the prover to get away with cheating if it can just cheat on the views of a single pair of parties, right? Maybe everyone is consistent, except one pair of parties are not consistent with each other. And so in that case, the probability of cheating you can show is going to be um, roughly two over N, where N is the number of parties that are being simulated in the secure computation protocol. Now that's, relatively high, right? Even if you set N equals to 100 parties, that means you're accepting a maybe one in 50 chance that the prover can get away with cheating. But actually it's not really a big deal because you can always reduce this by repeating the protocol uh, as many times as you want in order to drive down the probability of cheating to uh, however low of a value as you like. And we'll come back to that point later. The only point I'm making here is that a larger N, meaning a larger number of parties being simulated in the protocol will yield uh, better soundness but it's going to have a trade-off because it's going to be higher computation on the part of the prover. Um, let me just point out also that what's interesting here is that the efficiency considerations for the secure computation protocol that the prover is running are a little bit different from efficiency considerations for secure computation in general. So just as one example, uh, the round complexity of the protocol is pretty much irrelevant. Right, in the real world, when you're running a secure computation protocol and you might have parties distributed all over the world, you may care a lot about whether it's a you know, three round protocol or a 20 round protocol, because each round of interaction is gonna add to the total time taken to execute the protocol. But in this setting, remember the prover is simulating all of that, uh, all of that interaction locally, 
And so whether it's a three round protocol or a 20 round protocol doesn't really make much of a difference. And, uh, you know, ultimately it just all, all goes into a view that's sent over to the verifier and it doesn't really matter how many rounds the protocol takes. So that just shows that, that you know, you may, you may have uh, a different um, optimization space to explore here versus what people have been looking at for secure computation protocols uh, that are being run over a wide scale network. Um, this idea was uh, optimized and implemented in some prior work. Uh, they found in, in, their, in their case that the best trade-off was actually a small number of parties, n equals three, which gives a very high soundness error and therefore required a large number of repetitions. So something like 60 or 80 repetitions, uh, maybe even more actually. Um, so that's what the, where, where the prior work stood. So now coming to our work, what we observed is that we could extend this MPC in the head approach to handle a class of MPC protocols that rely on a trusted dealer to do some pre-processing before the, the protocol begins. Uh, we then showed an efficient MPC protocol that relies on such pre-processing and applied various optimizations. And then, as I said, showed applications to using that for constructing post-quantum signatures. So what is MPC with pre-processing? Well, here we assume we have some trusted dealer who is gonna distribute information to the parties in advance of the execution of the protocol. And it's important here that this be in advance of the, uh, the parties uh, even knowing what inputs they wanna run the protocol on but it can depend on the uh, function that they're going to be evaluating. So we imagine this dealer uh, initializes all the parties with some correlated state. Then the parties receive their inputs or they learn the inputs or they decide the inputs they want to run the protocol on, and then they run a protocol execution like before. Okay? And it turns out that this model gives you a lot of power because being able to rely on this trusted dealer allows you to do things much, much more efficiently. Uh, of course, it begs the question of where this trusted dealer comes from, and this is why people may not may choose not to use this kind of an approach for running real-world protocols. Um, but we'll see that in our case, we can assume, not that we can assume, we have it, we'll have it be the case that this dealer is going to be implemented by the prover. Okay, the prover itself is going to play the part of the trusted dealer. Remember, again, the prover is simulating the entire protocol locally, and so the prover can also just simulate the role of the dealer. Now, this opens up the possibility that the prover may now try to cheat, right? The prover can try to cheat by, you know, not being a trustworthy dealer and generating incorrect state during pre-processing. So what we're gonna have to do is somehow have the verifier check the correctness of pre-processing. The problem is that checking the correctness of pre-processing can only in general be done by opening up the views of all the parties. But if you open up the views of all the parties, you're gonna lose zero knowledge. So what we're gonna have to do is try, try modify this MPC in the head approach a little bit. We're gonna make it now a two-stage protocol where what we do is something like the following. We're gonna have the prover and verifier as before. Um, what the prover is gonna begin by doing is gonna begin by generating the initial state for the parties in M independent execute for M and independent executions of the pre-processing stage. Okay, so the prover is gonna do this uh, initial distribution of the, uh, of the state for the parties M times, box up each of those distributions of the state and send all M of them over to the verifier. The verifier will then ask to uh, challenge all but one of those, uh, of those um, iterations, uh, at which point the prover will open all but one of the boxes, thereby revealing the initial state of all the parties in the protocol for M minus one of these instances. So in this case, I just assume that uh, number one, the first one is the one that's not opened and all the rest are opened. So the verifier will then check all those and make sure that they were all done correctly. And that will give him some confidence that the remaining unopened one uh, was in fact done correctly. And then the prover will proceed as before. The prover will then take the unopened initial state for the parties, use that to run an execution of the secure computation protocol like before, box up the view of the parties like before, uh, everything actually except for the initial state because it's already committed to the initial state in round one. Uh, the verifier will then again challenge uh, the prover to open up the views of some subset of the parties. The prover will then open up those parties' views, including uh, those states that were committed in the initial round. And the verifier will then apply uh, these checks like before to check whether each of the views of these parties is not only consistent with the correct uh, execution of the protocol given the initial state that was committed in round one, but also that those executions of those parties are consistent with each other. Okay, so basically we've extended it from a three round protocol to a five round protocol where we add this initial check at the beginning to uh, basically force the prover 
to do the uh, to play the role of the dealer in an honest way and not to cheat. So let me try to convince you that this remains zero knowledge, right? So um, opening up all the party state from pre-processing, right, in the M minus one executions of that that we open reveals nothing about the input, right? Here's where we rely on the fact that the uh, pre-processing step is input independent. So it can't reveal anything about the input, even if we reveal the initial state of all the parties. Uh, opening up to T parties in the second stage is going to be fine like before, as long as the protocol we're using is, uh, is a T private protocol, is private when at most T parties are corrupted. Uh, soundness is a little bit more of an involved argument, but the basic idea is that the prover will only be able to cheat in the first phase with probability at most one over M, right? The only way it can try to cheat is if it sets up uh, one of the executions of the pre-processing incorrectly, but then it's gonna be caught uh, with, uh, except with probability one over M. Uh, and then conditioned on the fact that the pre-processing being used is correct, the cheating probability in the second phase of the protocol can be analyzed as before. So any questions about this? Before I go on. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do actually, so I, I've included, so now we have to instantiate this and, and we instantiate this with a secure computation protocol uh, that relies on pre-processing uh, that's based on some prior work of ours. Uh, it has the property that it's secure against N minus uh, one semi-honest corruption. So all but one of the parties can be corrupted. And given the initial state distributed by the dealer, um, the protocol is deterministic. So there was a question in the chat that now disappeared, actually. Whoever whoever put the question, you, do you want to speak the question? Sure. I just wanted to know, um, what are the determinants of honesty in these situations? So I'm not sure what you mean by determinants. Um, I mean, the party is honest if they follow the protocol. So is that is that what you're asking? Yeah, I was just wondering, like, what signs um, the verifier will look for. To determine oh, so so here actually, right? When I talk about this, the protocol, this this is now talking about the secure computation protocol. So what I'm saying is that we're designing a secure computation protocol uh, that that involves n parties. Um, as long as one party runs the protocol honestly, then no matter what the other, then well, in this case, it's semi-honest security. So as long as one party runs the protocol honestly, then even if the remaining n minus one parties are all controlled by an adversary who can see all of their views and all of their inputs and all of the messages they get, that adversary still learns nothing about the input of the remaining honest party. That, that's what it means. That's what it means here. And then coming back to the to the application to zero knowledge, um, uh, uh, let's, let's see. So there the, there the guarantee would be that the verifier, even if they're malicious, um, well, the verifier is not gonna learn anything because at most they're gonna learn the um, the views and the state of up to n minus one parties. Um, the protocol is also uh, very efficient. So what, let me say what I mean by efficiency here. So um, remember we have, the, we're in the pre-processing model. Um, the initial state of every party will have size exactly equal to the length of the input plus twice the size of the circuit. Uh, measuring the size of the circuit here in terms of the number of AND gates that it has. So if you have, and this is and this is measured in bits here. So if you have a circuit with, I don't know, 10,000 gates and it takes an input of length 100, then you have, you know, 20,000 and 100 bits going to each party. Um, each party during the course of the protocol also sends only one bit per um, bit of input and per bit and per uh, AND gate in the circuit. So again, if you have a, you know about 10,000 gates or so in the circuit, <clears throat> you're sending only 10,000 or so bits during the course of the protocol, uh, or amortized, you know, one bit per uh, per AND gate, which is low uh, actually, which is about you know at least 100 times lower or so than what's typically done in secure computation protocols. Um, so I had put in slides here for a description of the protocol. I think what I'm going to do is skip that. And I can come back to that if someone's interested and maybe it will come back, we'll have time at the end. Um, I think maybe this is le less important than um, going to the uh, main point of the talk here. So we have this. Oh yeah, and I didn't mention this before, but every every message being sent by all the parties is broadcast. There's no point to point channels here. And this is useful in our setting because then it means basically you don't have to replicate when the prover is committing to the views of the parties. Uh, it's enough actually just to commit once 
to to what's sent over the broadcast channel, and it doesn't have to individually, you know, include different uh, different communication for each party. Every party is seeing the same thing. Okay. So we then applied uh, a number of optimizations to this protocol. I think, again, in the interest of time, what I'll do is I'll cover some of these, but not all of these. Um, and I'll try to focus on some of the ones that are most interesting, perhaps. So I think one of the ones that's interesting is that, you know, forgetting about the top, because I didn't go over the description of the protocol, but basically there's some pre-processing that's going on, and there's a dealer that's giving information to the parties. And what I said is that each party's state is um, of length W plus twice the size of the circuit. But it turns out that um, all of the information given by the dealer to these parties is, um, uh, is basically random. And so what you can do is rather than giving this long information to each of the parties, what you can do is you can give each of them a small seed for a pseudo random generator. And then they, the parties can each locally use that seed to expand it to as many bits as they need. So like I said earlier, that there might be a case where the dealer would give to each party, say, 20,000 bits or so. But instead of giving those 20,000 bits to each party, what the dealer can do is just give each of them a 128-bit seed. And then they can take that seed and expand it using a pseudo-random generator uh, to get a, 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 a copy of what their share would be. Now, there is one consistency condition that needs to be satisfied. So something about the XOR of all the values uh, has to equal some value. Uh, because if, if the parties were just completely un uncorrelated, they wouldn't need the dealer. Uh, but you can do that just by giving an additional um, uh, C bits to one of the parties. So this basically ensures that the final C bits of what the parties have will XOR to the correct value. And so now you have a situation where um, all but one of the parties have their initial state compressed to like 128 bits, and one party is holding now 128 bits for their seed plus an additional C bits that allow them to correct their seed and get the, uh, and get the correct uh, value. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I want to I want to cover one other interesting thing here. Yeah, so one other interesting thing here is uh, this that uh, at, least, at least someone might appreciate um, is that you can also right, remember that we had uh, these different seeds now that we're giving to each of the parties. And rather than having n independent seeds that we give to the parties, what the prover can also do is generate each of those n seeds. So think if n is like 128, if we have 128 parties, generate all of those from one master seed. Okay, so we can use a single 128-bit value that I call here seed star, use a pseudo-random generator to generate seed one through seed n. And now we can, uh, you know, when, when the prover commits to the uh, initial state of the parties by sending, say, a hash of the hashes of the state, it can now reveal all those values to the verifier by simply sending the master seed seed star. The, the verifier can then regenerate all the seeds, seed one through seed n from seed star. Uh, it can compute all the, all the information it needs. It can recompute the hash and verify the result. And this just basically has the effect of reducing the communication to only you know, order of kappa bits, where kappa is some security parameter, let's say 128 bits or so. So this has a big impact on efficiency as well. Now, what's interesting is that for the unopened pre-processing phase, remember there's, there's one phase that we're going to leave unopened that the prover is then going to use to simulate the protocol. And in that case, right, in the second phase of the protocol, the verifier is going to ask the prover to reveal um, the, the initial state of n minus 1 of the parties. So the prover will have to reveal n minus 1 seeds. So it looks like that will require the prover to send these n minus 1 seeds over. But if we use this uh, you know, kind of trick that's appeared in many different uh, applications, using a binary tree to derive the seeds from the seed star, then we can do this actually using only logarithmic communication. So think now that we place a seed star at the root of the tree, and then we derive down the tree by applying some pseudo-random generator to double the length of the secret value. And so you go down the tree and you can generate as many values as you want in this way. And now if the uh, prover wants to reveal the seeds located at some number of leaves, in this case, all but one of the leaves, then it can do that by just revealing a logarithmic number of values in this tree, okay? Uh, so this is a this is a nice trick that I know uh, Alan has used before in some of his work as well, and so it's a good trick to be familiar with. Um, just revealing these logarithmically many values allows the verifier to then recompute, whoops, to recompute the values uh, of of all but one of the leaves, uh, but compresses the communication from linear to logarithmic. <clears throat> so that's another 
optimization that we rely on. Uh, let me skip some of these also and mention one other optimization. So I talked about the fact that the soundness error is um, uh, you have to balance the probability that the prover can cheat in the first phase, which was roughly one over M, and the probability that it can cheat in the second phase, which is one over N, where N was the number of parties in the protocol. And so what you can do, of course, is you can balance these by setting M equal to N, uh, and then, um, right, this, this is kind of a pictorial representation of what's going on. The prover is then sending these M independent executions of the pre-processing phase. The uh, verifier is selecting to, uh, to open all but one of those. Um, and then the remaining one that's unopened is used to run an execution of the protocol. Uh, the prover then using that, you know, the one, the blue one here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this blue one here with the arrow coming from it, um, using that pre-processing, the, the prover will run the uh, execution of the protocol. It'll box up the views of all n of the parties, and then some number of those will be challenged. Um, though, of course, if you do this, right, even a probability of one over 100 of cheating is, is not good. And so you can use parallel repetition, right? Repeat this basic building block t times. And as I said earlier, that will drive down the cheating probability to as low as you like, but it's not very efficient. And we can do better actually by, you know, rather than opening all but one of the executions in the initial phase, what we'll do instead is we'll have some parameter t, we'll open t of those executions, and we'll, re we'll use the remaining, uh, or here I guess I have opening m minus t, and then using the t remaining ones to run independent executions of the protocol, which are then checked uh, independently by the verifier. And this actually does give a, a, a bit of a better, uh, um, uh, better efficiency for the same soundness error that you want to achieve. Let me uh, go down here. Okay, so this is basically it. Um, so remember before I said that there were a couple of other examples of people trying to implement this MPC in the head approach. They were not using MPC with pre-processing. They were using different protocols that were actually much uh, more expensive. And because of that, they found that the best trade-off in their case was uh, to use a very small number of parties. Uh, we found in our case, actually, that using larger number of parties is better. Uh, we get better trade-offs and we're, and we're able actually by doing that um, to get, uh, to use a larger value of n, say n equals 16, 64, and uh, take benefit of the fact that, I um, uh, hope this will not kill me, but anyway, take, take advantage of the fact that we can now, the, the prover is doing everything in parallel. So they're running multiple executions of the protocol <clears throat> where each party in the protocol is doing the same thing. And so they can really take advantage of parallel processing here and get a very efficient uh, implementation. So somebody asked to annotate the board. I don't know if that meant they had a question or maybe they were letting me annotate. I'm not sure. Okay, did someone turn that on for me? Okay, anyway. Um, so roughly speaking then, um, the final execution of the protocol looks something like this. So the Prover is going to run these M executions of pre-processing. Uh, it's going to hash the initial state given to each of the parties. Uh, it's doing this for a total of M times and then hashing the whole thing. So this is only going to be uh, the output length of a hash uh, being sent to the, to the verifier. The verifier requests to open M minus T of them. Uh, the prover can do that using this binary tree trick I talked about before uh, and sending only uh, T log M over T seeds. Uh, the prover is then going to run T executions of the secure computation protocol. It's going to get these T uh, transcripts, uh, send a hash of them to the prover. So again, the communication there is pretty low. And then the verifier is going to request to open all but one party in each of those executions. And the communication that the prover will have to send to the verifier per execution is only going to be uh, uh, C bits, so the number of AND gates in the circuit plus another log n seeds to regenerate all the initial states, and then another uh, another hash, and then c bits for the communication of the unopened party. So I'm just showing here that the overall communication here is quite low. It's uh, essentially twice times c number of bits, plus some small amount of overhead corresponding to a bunch of cryptographic seeds. Um, I, as I described the protocol, it's a, it was a five round zero knowledge protocol. Uh, if you've ever seen applications of turning zero knowledge protocols to signatures, you know that usually we want a three round protocol. Uh, we can actually make our protocol into a three round protocol um, by just compressing things. I guess maybe I'll, I won't go into the details of that, 
uh, it's, it's the same, you know, overall high level structure, just compressing things down to three rounds. Okay, so what do we have? We have basically, and even if you didn't follow the crypto there, you can now come back and uh, we're now gonna just talk about turning this to a signature scheme. So what we've developed is a um, this three round proof that we can make non-interactive using the fiat Shamir transform. It's a an honest verifier zero knowledge proof uh, for, or, or it's a zero knowledge proof, forget about the honest verifier, for arbitrary circuits. And it has a relatively small uh, proof size. Um, and in fact, it has the best known proof size for any non-interactive zero knowledge proof for circuits with roughly um, uh, up to 100,000 AND gates. So there are actually uh, some proof systems that some of which were developed roughly concurrently with our own that are better asymptotically, but the asymptotics don't kick in until you get to uh, circuits with roughly more than 100,000 gates. Uh, and, never, and while that's interesting and that's great, and there certainly are things that you might want to do with more than 100,000 gates, there are also lots of interesting things you can do with less than 100,000 gates, uh, one of which we'll talk about next. The other thing I want to highlight, and this may not have been entirely clear, but I think if you uh, think about it, you realize that I never mentioned any public key cryptographic primitives during anything I talked about. And in fact, the entire protocol is based only on hash functions and pseudo-random generators, and there's no public key cryptography uh, being used, no, no discrete log, no factoring, no anything else. Okay. So it's a, it's a symmetric key-based uh, zero-knowledge proof with a small proof size. And we can, of course, use this to turn it into a signature scheme. Before I do that, let me just mention, you, you may all be familiar with this already, but uh, there's a lot of interest nowadays in post-quantum crypto. Uh, all current public key crypto systems, uh, currently deployed public key crypto systems are vulnerable to quantum computers. Um, symmetric key crypto is not vulnerable. There, there may be, uh, you may require an increase in key length to handle certain quantum attacks, but, it, but quantum attacks don't completely invalidate current symmetric key crypto. And uh, we're concerned, or there is a concern that quantum computers are coming, right? It seems like maybe the worst case scenario is that, uh, you know, quantum computers that could potentially start breaking existing public key crypto, uh, according to some estimates, maybe five years away. Uh, from the point of view of academics, I think the best case scenario is that it will remain five years away for the next 20 years, so we can continue asking for funding to solve this important problem uh, and keep doing that multiple times. Um, but either way, we need to look at post-quantum replacements. And this is, for example, being done as part of this ongoing NIST competition I talked about earlier, where they're actually pretty close now, I think a year away or so from the end, uh, after they will have some set of schemes for uh, key exchange and public key encryption and digital signatures that will be uh, believed to be viable post-quantum replacements. Now, you can construct signatures uh, in general from Honest verifier proofs of no honest verifier zero knowledge proofs of knowledge, and one way you can do that is uh, the following general uh, prototype. So the private key of the signer will be some random value x. The public key of the signer will be f of x, where f is some hard to invert function, some one-way function. Uh, and the signature is going to be a non-interactive zero knowledge proof of knowledge of x. So basically, I'm going to prove to you, uh, and actually this comes back to the question before about identification schemes. So if you do this interactively, then you maybe get an identification scheme uh, where you prove that you know the pre-image of the public value Y. If you make this non-interactive, you get a signature scheme. So my signature will be uh, you know, bound to the message in some way and otherwise proving that I indeed know the private key corresponding to the public key. Okay. And if you're going to try to make a signature scheme out of this, and if you're going to try to make one based on the zero knowledge proof of knowledge we talked about that we just constructed, uh, then the circuit size of the function f is going to be critical, right? You're going to want some f, some one-way function that has a very small circuit size and use that in constructing your signature scheme. And luckily, um, there's been a lot of work recently on exactly constructing very small uh, compact circuits that are believed to be one-way functions. And in particular, people have looked at constru constructing uh, block ciphers that can be implemented using very small circuits. And if you take a block cipher now, denoted by a capital X, you can get a one-way function from that block cipher uh, by just making the private value, the secret value X, the key. And then your function is gonna be, use that key 
and evaluate the block size for using that key on the zero input and get some value y. So now your public value is y, your, the, the corresponding private value is a key such that y decrypts to zero under that key. And as I said, there's been some work on developing very lightweight uh, block ciphers. Uh, the one we use in, is called LoMC. Uh, it offers a 256-bit key and block size, and it can be implemented in about 1,500 AND gates. So pretty, pretty small, actually. Um, and so if we take that and take this approach, uh, use LoMC, and then plug in uh, the uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge proof system that we constructed, we get a signature scheme that we call PICNIC, which, as I said at the beginning of the talk, was submitted to the NIST uh, post-quantum competition. Uh, it is actually pretty competitive. I'll, I'll show some performance results in a slide or two. And uh, it was one of nine signature schemes to make it to the second round. And it was chosen also as one of three alternates in the third round. The third round was, was announced about two months ago. Uh, there were three signature schemes chosen uh, to advance to the third round, and then three chosen as alternates for the third round, which basically, well, I won't go into that people ask me, but um, uh, anyway, that means that it was it was deemed you know, to be efficient enough that it could potentially be a, be a viable uh, standard. And uh, what's interesting is if you can compare this to uh, another class of signatures that are also based entirely on symmetric key primitives, which are uh, basically, uh, well, well, it's called Sphinx Plus, and it's basically uh, some variant on uh, using hash functions inside of Merkle trees in order to construct signatures. And uh, what you can see is that the signature length of our scheme, which is the top row, is uh, lower than, is smaller than the signature length of Sphinx Plus when it's optimized for signing speed, um, although it's about 50% larger than uh, the version of, of Sphinx Plus that's optimized for signature length. And the signing time is actually um, better than even the fast version of Sphinx Plus and much better than the version uh, of Sphinx Plus optimized for signature length. Uh, verification is a little bit slower. It's about eight times, uh, you know, depending which one you're comparing it to, three to eight times slower, but still pretty reasonable. And so it does give you a viable alternative to constructing signatures from, uh, from uh, symmetric key primitives. And I'll just mention that we can use our techniques to construct more advanced uh, post-quantum signatures, these privacy-preserving signatures uh, called ring and group signatures. Uh, without going into detail, these basically offer you the ability to sign uh, on behalf of a group without revealing which member of the group actually released the signature. And it's been in the past very difficult to construct these based on post-quantum assumptions. Uh, we don't have constructions from hash functions like we do for Sphinx Plus. Uh, you can have constructions based on lattices, but those have traditionally been uh, a bit inefficient. And um, at the time, these were among the most efficient uh, post-quantum schemes of this type. So just to summarize, uh, I think this has been uh, another example of these theoretical insights leading to practical improvements. Uh, in particular, this MPC in the head approach was, was again, something that people developed, uh, came you know, from theorists who were really just interested in uh, the beautiful idea of connecting secure computation and zero knowledge, not really concerned with practical efficiency, but nevertheless, you know, 10, 15 years later, it actually led to uh, a practical scheme. And I think it's interesting to explore how much further we can push these ideas. We've already had a number of optimizations in the course of preparing the submission for NIST and then during the process of the competition. And I think, you know, the other high level point I want to leave you with is that I think it's really a great time to be working in crypto because all of these beautiful theoretical ideas are really being uh, uh, grabbed very quickly by people who want to put this into practice. There's really a very active now um, connection between stuff coming out of the crypto world, the academic world, and startups who are really eager to uh, try to commercialize this stuff. And so it's a very exciting time to be in the field. So I'll just end there. Um, if you're interested, I put the uh, conference paper that these ideas are based on, and also you can look at the uh, uh, design document that we included along with our submission to the NIST competition that, com that um, includes full details of the scheme. There's also a corresponding implementation document that gives you the low-level details of how it was implemented, and I'll refer you there for further information. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions uh, that anyone has. The only thing I'll mention is that I have to leave by about five after one for, for another meeting. 
but that leaves us about 10 minutes for questions if there are any. So I saw there was again a question that popped up and then disappeared. So if anyone wants to speak the question. Uh, Jonathan, uh, I was wondering if this is connected to fully homomorphic mor morphic, uh, encryption. So uh, it's not really connected at all. So fully homomorphic encryption, uh, and I'm maybe glad you brought it up. So somehow p this buzzword of fully homomorphic encryption uh, entered people's consciousness. And um, you know, most of the things that fully homomorphic encryption can do uh, can can be done by secure computation. And so uh, secure computation has been around for much longer. Uh, this is basically using, uh, and it's much more efficient than fully homomorphic encryption. Um, and so the, uh, the stuff we're doing here is, I would say, more efficient and based on weaker assumptions. It's based entirely on symmetric key, uh, not based on lattices or any public key assumptions at all, and it's much more efficient. So, so the stuff that I'm talking about today is, is not really uh, connected to fully homomorphic encryption. Nevertheless, I think fully homomorphic encryption and some of the offshoots of fully homomorphic encryption, you know, maybe give another example of something that came out of the theory community that people are trying to look to pick up and, and see what they can do with and trying to commercialize. So from that point of view, there's a there's a connect, conceptual connection, but but technically there's no, there's no connection between that and what I talked about today. Uh, applying, I, I don't know if I got the whole question, something about applying cryptographic uh, analyzers to um, to uh, prove security of protocols. I think uh, that's very interesting. I think it depends a little bit which crypto, uh, which analyzers you're talking about. There's a very interesting line of work um, that uh, on constructing um, tools for formal verification of cryptographic proofs. And I'm referring here in particular to uh, EasyCrypt. Um, that gives, like I said, a way to formally check cryptographic proofs of security. Some of the other tools that I've seen, I think, are good, but they're potentially a little bit, yeah, so CPSA, right, I think it's a little bit limited. So CPSA, uh, as far as I understand, first of all, only applies to some, like, authentication protocols. Uh, I don't think it, it applies to signature schemes or zero knowledge or secure computation or anything else. Uh, the other thing is that, as I understand it, but I'm, but I'm not uh, entirely up to date on that, is that CPSA will only um, can find attacks, can find flaws in authentication protocols. Um, I don't think that it can rigorously proves, prove that no attacks exist. It may be able to prove that certain classes of attacks don't exist, but I don't think it gives you kind of a cryptographic proof of security in some um, well-defined threat model against some assumption. It abstracts out certain primitives like encryption and um, um, uh, so there, it's kind of a giving you weaker guarantees than, than what you might get with a cryptographic security proof. So then there was a question about the prover. I didn't understand what the question was actually. Professor? Okay. Yeah? Yeah. I'm wondering like uh, during the online process, can this protocol detect when sender is malicious? That is the sender will send the in, incorrect uh, co commit value to the verifier. So can this protocol detect that? Yeah, so this protocol, the zero knowledge protocol has soundness. So if the prover tries to cheat, uh, what would it mean for the prover to cheat? That would mean that the prover has a circuit, but in yeah. fact, the circuit is unsatisfiable, but the prover wants to convince the verifier that it is. So the answer is that no, the prover can't do that because the protocol is sound. So um, so yeah, so, so, so you, cannot, you cannot prove, uh, you cannot give proofs of false statements. Okay, so I guess otherwise, um, uh, I'll leave you with that. I guess there are no more questions. So thanks. It was great uh, coming, and maybe I hope to to join in the future for one of these uh, one of these talks that you announced at the beginning of today. Well, well, thank you very much. It was a very uh, exciting talk, and I will be posting the video um, on the CDL webpage. Um, and yes, all of our talks are open to the public, and you're welcome to come anytime. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, CPSA. Um, in particular, we've analyzed um, SRP and. Uh, opaque 
Oh, I didn't realize that, I didn't realize that it could be used to analyze password protocols. Um, it, it's not restricted to um, uh, any class of um, protocols like that. Um, it, it does have limitations that it does not find algebraic or cryptographic attacks. But if it completes, there's actually a proof that it's if it's found all possible equivalency classes of uh, protocol executions. So I'd be interested to maybe hear, um, uh, you know, either either in 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 the 30 seconds now, or if not at some later point, how how it deals with password protocols. Because for a password protocol, there's always some noticeable probability that the attacker can just guess the password, right? Right. Um, I I can send you our paper on SRP. Sure. Sure. Yeah, great. <clears throat> okay, so um, th thanks again, and I remind everybody that um, next week, November 6, uh, Farah Giovanni will be talking in a special CDL talk. Great. All right, well, thanks again. Thank you.